Well, if you could turn in your copy of God's Holy Word to Psalm 34, Psalm 34. Our focus will be on verse 19, but we will read the entirety of the psalm for context. Now, we've come to a stopping point in our series on public worship, on gospel worship, and we have our communion preparatory services beginning next Lord's Day. So uh, it didn't make sense for me to go back into Hebrews to be away from Hebrews for two weeks. So uh, what we're going to do is consider uh, this topical sermon on affliction. And it arose especially as I was praying through the needs of the congregation, and it just astonished me how many areas of affliction, not just in number but in kind, that many of us are facing. And so it seemed good to preach on that topic. Well, with that then, trusting you're in Psalm 34 now, please give your attention to the reading of God's holy word, Psalm 34. These are the very words of God. Let us receive them as such. A Psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away and he departed. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him, and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him, and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth around them that fear him, and delivereth them. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. O fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. And again in verse 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray for the preaching. O Lord, our God, we come to a text that is difficult in many ways, difficult for us to hear on one hand, and also a great joy. And there is no earthly way that this man can preach the glories of such a text. And so we ask, O God, that your spirit would rest on the minister who preaches, that this servant would decrease and diminish so that the people of God would truly perceive that it is Jesus Christ the Lord who is tending to them now and speaking to those precious lambs that he has purchased with his own blood. To that end, Father, give the Spirit of the Lord. Give the Spirit of the Lord to the preacher and also give the Spirit of the Lord to those who will hear. And so, Father, to that end, to the end that you would be glorified for the works you do in us in the times in which we are afflicted, we pray that you would let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. For we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, as you heard this morning, there are parts and portions of the Word of God that we simply wish to evade. Tonight we come to another portion of the Word that we often want to gloss over. The promise here that says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But if you evade this truth, child of God, when afflicted, you will become troubled in your souls. Whenever you are afflicted, you begin to wonder, where is God? 
Has he left me? Has he abandoned me? Is he even there, O Lord? Why am I of all people suffering so horribly? And what does this do? It simply adds to the sinful, uh, it simply adds sin to affliction and worry to the affliction that we already suffer. It's not only a greater burden on our soul, but it actually adds to our sin when we think in such ways. Sadly, evading from this truth also robs us of the comfort that is found in the latter half of the verse. But the Lord delivereth him out of them all. So we have to remember these kinds of truths in the Bible. If you are not currently afflicted, you need to store this up in your heart for the time of affliction. And if you are in the midst of an affliction, you need to know this now in the midst of your affliction. So for all of the people of God, we need to know the truth of this, ver- this word and this verse so that we may walk faithfully and learn the lesson that the Lord intends us to have in affliction. And so our theme this afternoon is simple. It's how to respond to the many afflictions of the righteous. How to respond to the many afflictions of the righteous. And we'll divide our theme into three matters to understand. First is the many afflictions. Second is the promised deliverance. And third is the godly response. How do we conduct ourselves, in other words, in the midst of affliction? So first, the many afflictions. Our psalm says it clearly and plainly. Many are the afflictions of who, though, people of God? Of who? The righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And you have to ask, who are the righteous ones? Who can they be when the Bible plainly says that there is none righteous? No, not one in Romans 3.10. The righteous, you have to know this because I pray and trust this is you. The righteous are those with faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. That's who we are. God justifying the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Romans 4 verse 5. These who are righteous, they are predestinated by the Lord to come to faith, plucked from out of the world, given the righteousness of Jesus, imputed to them and received by faith alone. Though they are sinners, great sinners, yes, they say of Jesus, He is the Lord, our righteousness. They're not righteous in themselves. They're counted righteous. That's vital. You're going to find that is vital for you to understand in this doctrine of affliction. For in our being, we are not made perfectly righteous, not until glory where we behold God. But you who are declared righteous through your faith in Jesus Christ are currently being sanctified. That's this process in this life where you are progressively being made more holy in your person. You're growing in holiness. You're growing in faith. You're growing in knowledge. You're also, and we forget that this is part of sanctification, you are growing in dependence upon God. That's a part of our sanctification we are quick to forget. And so the righteous are those here in this text that have faith in Jesus Christ, saved by the blood and life of Christ, saved out of the love of God for them, a love from before the world's foundations. And you might think, as natural man and often Christians are prone to think, so these righteous then, saved by Christ, ah, these are the ones who are spared from affliction. Loved by God, they must be spared of affliction. But what does the text say? Many, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Those with faith are going to suffer many afflictions. Not just one affliction in your life, child of God, but many. And we think in our fallenness that one beloved of God could never be afflicted if he truly loved them. And so this is where we begin to despair. But I would just say, child of God, have you never read your Bible closely? Have you never read your Bible closely? Did you forget about Job? Did you forget his many afflictions? Afflicted by the death of his children, afflicted by his wife, and afflicted by his friends, afflicted in sores and boils, his body continually on fire. And did you forget how this man was introduced to you in the Bible? 
There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Was he introduced as the world's greatest sinner? No, he was introduced as the very opposite. The most righteous man on the earth. Job, in another, in another way of looking at it, is a, a book-length commentary on this one verse that we have here. So then what about the wicked? Strange to us, and we don't remember this, the Bible paints their life as often much, much less afflicted than ours. This is what caused Asaph to despair in Psalm 73. For I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. All that to say, Christian, uh, maybe you need to sweat a little if your life is not filled with many afflictions. Because the wicked in the Bible receive far fewer troubles and afflictions. You remember the woe in Luke 6 and the Beatitudes. Woe unto you when what? All men speak well of you. But who gained the blessing? Blessed are you when men curse you and revile you. Such texts shred apart, utterly shred apart, the wicked health and wealth prosperity gospel, friends. Survey the greatest men and women of the Bible, and you will see the truth of it. The greatest of the saints are those who suffered the greatest afflictions. Think on Job, Ruth, Moses, David, Esther, Paul, and John, just to name a few. Ruth and her bereavement and poverty. Moses and his exile suffering the reproaches of Christ. David being tormented by Saul, and later his own apostate son, Absalom. Daniel with his trials and tribulations in Babylon. Esther suffering the sadness of her beauty pageant marriage and hiding the fact that she was a Jewess. Paul with his many stripes and beatings, persecutions, hungering, a thorn in the flesh. John in exile at Patmos. But above all, there is our Savior, grievously afflicted in soul and body. As many as were a stony dead, the His visage was so marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Many are the afflictions of the righteous beloved, both in kind and in number. Think of the kinds of afflictions that you will face in this fallen world. And these are just a few because we do not have until midnight today, like Paul might preach. We suffer afflictions in body. Our outer man decays. We suffer great pain at times. From birth, some men and women are born into affliction, being born lame or blind. Others are struck with diseases in life. Many Christians become senile in their latter days. We suffer afflictions in our soul. Our inner man is often in turmoil. Our assurance of salvation is shaken at times. We have soul troubles. We are tempted. Our soul is grieved at our affinity for sin. We fall into sin and our conscience is inflamed with how sinful we are. The accuser grabs hold of our conscience and whispers, How dare you think you are a Christian? We forget the gospel, the grace of repentance and the forgiveness of sins. We forget to look to Jesus and we become more afflicted because of that. Afflictions of soul. Afflictions of sorrow. We will suffer bereavement in this life. Our loved ones die, even our spouses We suffer abandonment even. We suffer under the sorrows of friends or loved ones apostatizing or betraying us. We suffer affliction in persecution, being reviled for the sake of being believers, as you heard in um, the the Beatitudes. Today you're seeing even in this country, which has been so so, um, friendly to Christians that Often now, government powers in certain states are starting to afflict believers. States like Colorado coming after Christian businesses. And there are many, many more afflictions, friends. Many, not few, are the kinds of afflictions that the righteous suffer. But then they are not just many in kind, but also in number. Do not think if you've been afflicted, well, I guess my days of affliction are over. It may very well be that you face another affliction even soon after the affliction that you're in, or maybe it will be added to the affliction you are facing. You may suffer affliction one after another your whole life, this present life. And what is our response typically when affliction comes? We say, oh, woe is me. No one else suffers like I do. 
My sorrows are greater than anybody else's. Our, our pitiful state and condition begins as we throw a pity party and we forget many are the afflictions of the righteous. And your narrow vision and mine too, and I think about this, and I think about how the godly suffer. We forget that we don't even pay attention to our brethren who suffer. So many of our brethren suffer as the Bible exhorts them to, that we don't realize David's example. I was dumb, and I opened not my mouth, because thou didst it. Psalm 39.9. Many of our brethren don't even open their mouth when they suffer. And so we don't even know that the godly all around us are suffering. So you might ask, why so many afflictions? Why, what is the purpose in it? Well, first, before we ask about the purpose in it, you have to recognize the source of the affliction. These afflictions come from our Father in heaven. As David said in the 39th Psalm that I just cited, Thou didst it. He was silent because he knew God has done this. And when you think of him as our father in heaven, he's our father that afflicts his children and he never does it angrily. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him in Psalm 103. And so whatever he does, whatever he does to us is always for our good, such that David could say, affliction has been good for me. Or as Paul would say, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Hebrews 12.7. That text teaches us about afflictions then. Though we are justified, we all need further sanctification to be refined and purified further in this life. And you need to think on this as well, believer. For the believer, this life is the life of fiery trials and not the next. And we say hallelujah for that. There's no fiery place like purgatory for you, believer, as that Pope who deceives many would say. No, believers await future glory. The next place for us is a place of perfect joy and peace called the paradise of God. No tears, no pain. The former things will be passed away, delivered from our troubles there. But while we are here, we are refined by the refiner's fire. Truth is, friends, much corruption remains in you and me, believer. There is far too much sin, far too much unbelief, far too much dependency on our own strength, far too little seeking and seeing God. Though Job was the most righteous man on the earth at the time, he understood this. He said in Job 23.10, He knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. When the Lord had tried him, this man who is called perfect and righteous, though only for the imputed righteousness of Christ, still there being some corruption in him, he knew that he would emerge as gold when his trials were over, refined of his dross. And so through affliction, you also learn these two wonderful habits, holiness and dependence on the Lord. Psalm 119.71, David said, It is good for me that I have been afflicted. I already cited that. Why? Why did he say it was good? That I might learn thy statutes. Afflictions, then, have been rightly called by our godly forefathers the school of Christ. The school of Christ. You know, we tell children, we tell children, don't play with fire, right? We say that's based on the sixth commandment. But some children just do not learn until they touch the fiery furnace. And then they are afflicted. And they will never touch that furnace ever again. It was good for me that I was afflicted, that I may learn thy statutes. We're all the same way, friends. We go astray so readily until the Lord grabs our attention in affliction. Psalm 119.67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. The question is really in our affliction, child of God, if you're afflicted right now or you are about to be in an affliction, will you learn the lesson Christ the schoolmaster intends to teach you? Or will you be as a horse or mule with no understanding? When you're at ease in this world, and I am too, friends, when you're at ease with this world and you're at ease with your sin, you and I go astray quickly, beloved. And there is nothing 
for the child of God quite like affliction to draw our attention to heaven and holiness. Persecution, famine, pestilence, pain, all of it is meant to draw your attention to heaven, which is our eternal abode, of course, where Jesus Christ is seated at God's right hand. And so affliction makes us cry out in prayer, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Not my will, but thy will be done in affliction. Let me learn thy statutes, O God. You have sent me to Christ's school, and so let me learn the lesson, Lord. But you know what? We won't say any of this until we value the word of God and the ways of God. Not until we have Job's mind, right? Neither have I gone back from the commandments of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Now you see, what the man is saying is this. All my earthly comforts are nothing compared to the word of God. Afflict me, Father, because your word is greater than my earthly comforts. Uh, We sang this, didn't we not? The word that cometh from thy mouth is better unto me than many thousands and great sums of gold and silver be in the metrical version. What you need to do, friends, is say that the words of my beloved Jesus' mouth are more precious to me than any earthly comfort. That if I am afflicted, it is good for me that I may learn the word of God and the will of God. See, this is the only way you will profit from affliction, friends. This is the only way you will and can see how good it is to be afflicted. Only when you elevate the words of life above every earthly comfort, even to the point that you might utter such a bold prayer as you deal with your sin. O oh Lord, afflict me if that is what it takes for my stubborn heart to learn from Christ and be broken of my sinfulness. You know, when it came to his comfort, you remember what Moses chose? Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Hebrews 11.25 Do you see, we have to first get our understanding of where the word of God and where a holiness fits into our life, and then only will we profit from affliction. This is how the godly see affliction, beloved. They will choose affliction over sin. They would choose affliction to know Christ better because affliction draws them closer to the schoolmaster and to depend on him as well. So with that, to understand affliction, let us consider our second heading, which is the promised deliverance. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. And in verse 17 here in our psalm, the righteous cry and the Lord delivers them out of all their troubles. These are promises from God, beloved. As sure as many uh, many afflictions are promised to you, you have a sure promise of deliverance. And what you have to see then, because we we ignore this, and we feel like we're left hanging in affliction, but the Lord God has said there is an end to affliction. You are never left hanging in affliction. We see in the midst of our affliction as though they are never ending, that they will never be resolved. No, every affliction ends. You will be delivered from all of them. And I know that's very hard. It's very hard to believe that in the midst of a fiery trial, beloved. But you need to hang on to this promise from the word. And you must also say, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Psalm 30, verse 5. And you need to look back at this Bible that you have before you. And you need to think on church history. And you need to ask the question, has Jesus ever been unfaithful to his promise to deliver his people from affliction? Has there ever been a saint who has not been delivered from affliction? Can any saint in heaven say now that this is not a trustworthy saying? Our psalm says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Will you taste and see people of God. He says he will deliver you out of them. And how many? All. He delivers you from them all, not just some. Did you hear that? He will, a sure thing, deliver you from them all. No exception. Many are our afflictions, yes, but all will be resolved. 
Whatever affliction you face today, the Lord will deliver you from it. Whatever affliction you face tomorrow, the Lord will deliver you from it. And if afflictions have been resolved in your life, you know that each and every affliction that you have faced, that the Lord has brought you to on this side of it, has been resolved. What does God say we must learn from Job? You have heard of the patience of Job, and you have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. James 5.11 One day you will see very clearly that in every affliction you have faced, the Lord is very pitiful and full of mercy, tender mercy. In the beatific vision, you will see that, but you must, you must believe it now, pilgrim. You must believe it now. And so when you're afflicted, say, I have come into the school of affliction to learn the pity and tender mercy of my God to anticipate that one day I will look with astonishment at how the Lord will deliver me and uphold me, to be astonished to see the means of deliverance, just as astonished as Israel was in the Exodus, or that most astonishing deliverance of all, the cross, our astonishing deliverance from hell. What you have to do is you have to anticipate these things. You have to anticipate one day I will give such glory to God when I see how these things were resolved and the lessons I learned and how I grew to love the Lord and to see his working in all the areas of my life. But don't wait till then, give glory to God now and see how he is using affliction. And so when you are afflicted, never, ever, ever lose hope, child of God. He will deliver you. And our temptation, our unspoken sinful suspicion is God is doing this to destroy me or crush me. And so with both hands, believer, take hold of the two promises in our text. With the left hand, take many are the afflictions of the righteous. And how a terrible thing it would be if it were not fused to the second promise. So take up with the right hand and fuse together, but he delivereth him from them all. He will. Either in this life or in the life to come, he will deliver you. There is no doubt about it because our God who cannot lie has bound himself to this as in an oath. Let God be true and every man a liar. Every affliction ultimately, friend, is ended in the eternal weight of glory. You know, we think of our afflictions, there are many in kind and number, but the Bible says this, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us what? A far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 2 Corinthians 4.17. In the midst of your trials, you must, must believe the Lord will deliver you. You need to admit to the Lord in prayer, you will deliver me. You have promised to me, you will never leave me nor forsake me. So help me endure with patience as Job did. Help me to see the end of the affliction. Help me see what I have at the end of it will be far better than if I had not been afflicted. And help me be afflicted and use the affliction. See, we are not just escapist in affliction. We're not just looking to the end of the affliction, but we must look to how to profit from the affliction. David said he was going to learn the statutes of God. You need, and I need to learn dependence on the Lord. We need to see the glory of having the power of Christ rest upon us. And when others look on us and say, how in the world is this person still alive? The strain and the stress must have destroyed him long ago. They look at you in astonishment as you give glory to God because he is the one who has upheld you this whole time. And you say, Lord, help me see that the span of my life is but a vapor. And what a wonderful thing that is. You know, you think about this, you know, when you're younger, you maybe think, oh, what a terrible thing that my life is but a vapor. As you get older, beloved, I think you start to see the glory of that, that this life is but a vapor, and then there is the eternal weight of glory that is ahead of you. And you say, praise God, that this affliction, even if it lasts a lifetime, what is that ultimately? 
What is that to me, O Lord, in view of the eternal weight of glory? And the grace he will work through prayers and thoughts like that will console your soul. You know, to be patient in prayer under affliction is our great need. And you need to see the hand of Christ in affliction. I already mentioned this. Affliction comes from his own hand. And when you are refined, when you come out as gold, as Job knew he would, it's the same hand that pulls you out of the affliction as well. He says that he delivers you out of them all, right? Him out of them all. The Lord's hand is a hand of deliverance out of the affliction. But it's there also. You need to understand that the hand of the Lord didn't just drop you into the vat, so to speak, of of refinement. His hand is still there around you as you are being refined. And it's never going to let you go. The refiner we saw in Malachi who refines that silver, we saw that he is constant in tending to it, keeping his attention on it, never once taking his eye off of it. It's firmly wrapped around you, friends, in the furnace of affliction. He says, the apostle does, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Affliction cannot separate you. Are you so persuaded The apostle was persuaded. I am persuaded. Are you persuaded, child of God, that nothing can separate you from his love, especially not affliction he has brought to you himself? Or will you uh, will you believe the accuser of the brethren that the Lord has reneged his promise to never leave you nor forsake you? Will you believe the father of lies or the word of God? And beloved, you know, The word of God promises this, even in this very psalm, that Jesus is near to you in affliction. Verse 18, the Lord is nigh unto them who are what? Of a broken heart. Verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. You see, the Lord closely monitors the affliction he applies to you. He cleanly is looking at you. He never once removes his omniscient eye off of you. His comfortable presence is there for you when your heart is broken, he says. And you must never forget that he who afflicts himself suffered great afflictions for you. Even in the Old Testament, you see that promise of Christ. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. And he bare them and carried them all the days of old. Isaiah 63, verse 9. Look unto Jesus in the furnace of affliction, right? You know, those three friends, Daniel's three friends, they, they beheld the Son of God there with them. And you can behold by faith the Son of God through the Word of God is there, and He is there purging you in the fires of affliction. And you know, He still, do you forget this, child of God, that even in glory, He still bears those marks of His affliction that He suffered for you. Never lose track of that that he has through his affliction delivered you out of the greatest affliction of all, eternal damnation for your sinfulness and the torments of eternal hell. And now he doesn't condemn you in affliction, but he is purifying you. In affliction, praise God, there is no condemnation for them which are in Christ Jesus. Instead, this light and momentary chastening, this refining of God is mercy. Remember this, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. 1 Peter 4, 18 and 19. Commit your souls to him. Commit your souls to him as unto a faithful creator, beloved, in your sufferings. And you see that even in there in 1 Peter 4.18. He says, as you suffer, don't stop doing good. Don't stop living as a Christian. Don't go into the fetal position and tune out and stop walking with the Lord. Commit your souls to him and keep suffering well. You know, sermons like this 
must be, as I was thinking about it, completely saturated in the word. Because with such a heavy matter as affliction, you really need God's word to minister in a, in a, in a strong way to you. And as you survey the scriptures, when it comes to our afflictions, you see that our afflictions become light and momentary, and we understand the purpose behind them. Well, lastly then, and we'll spend a bit of time here, uh, the godly response, or how we deal with afflictions in the moment. And so, in order to make the most of your afflictions, you must learn, you must come to learn, really in some ways, learn what you have to learn in affliction which is really the point of this heading. So let's consider some of the lessons that he might teach you in it. First, I've already covered this, so I won't spend much time on this. You must learn from his word. David saw his afflictions were good for him. Why? That he might better learn God's word. And so in affliction, is it your, your, your sense spiritually that I must go and go to the word of God? Is that what you say when you're afflicted? I need to turn to God's word in my affliction. Not just for comfort, yes, for comfort certainly, but even to learn of God and to learn the duties I owe God. Your afflictions must press you in that. You need to learn. Learn the nature of God from the Bible. If affliction comes from his hand, learn whose hand this is. Oh, what will you learn? There's a God that promises that he will not break a bruised reed. He will not quench a smoking flax. In Lamentations 3... But though he caused grief, yet will he have compassion according to the multitude of his his mercies. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Oh, what a thing we have to hear. It's not as though our God delights in afflicting me. But instead, I say, Lord, I understand. If there were a better way, the good physician would have chosen it. If there were a better way to learn the lesson, I know you, O Lord, do not afflict willingly, and you would have chosen another way. And so I learn from the Bible that in his wisdom and goodness, my affliction is necessary for my good. Necessary. Not happenstance. It's necessary. He is not cruel but compassionate. Again, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. Learn that God never suffers, of course, right? In Isaiah 63. But it is a speech concerning God's great sympathy and expressed uh, especially in the heart of the God-man, Jesus Christ. You know, when we read of in all their affliction he was afflicted, uh, I hope you remember the road to Damascus. Will you not remember what our Savior said to, to Paul? He said, Saul, Saul, Why persecutest thou me? In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And we read in Hebrews 4, We don't have a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You need to learn that Christ is compassionate and he's touched with the feeling of your infirmities and your afflictions. You need to believe it and you need to learn the duties that you owe such a God out of love from out of his word and then do those things. Second, you must learn how to rest on the power of God and not your strength. The Apostle Paul said something that is so far from us. He said, rather, I would glory in my infirmities. I would glory in my infirmities. Why Why would he glory in infirmities? He said that the power of Christ may rest on me. That I may know that his grace is sufficient for me. That I may know Jesus and I may have further communion with the Lord. And that I may see the power of God working in me. Your afflictions must cause you, cause you friends, to not cling to your strength, beloved. Your afflictions must show you how much grace and how much power there is for you in Jesus. You learn to be carried along by Jesus Christ. In affliction, you learn that what I need to learn is that I have no strength whatsoever. And if I have been working and operating in that way, it's been a farce all this time. I truly do depend on God. 
We still believe, friends, and it is something that is so pugnacious in us, so hard to remove. We all believe we're going to heaven on our own two feet. That is untrue, friends. Jesus Christ carries us off to heaven, not we ourselves. Third, you must learn compassion. This is particularly necessary in the school of Christ, to not just love God, but also love neighbor. In Exodus 23, 9, the Lord says this, Thou shalt not oppress a stranger. Why? For you know the heart of a stranger. See that? Seeing you were strangers in the land of Egypt. In other words, your affliction in Egypt should have taught you this, people of God. You should have compassion to strangers. As you're afflicted, you are taught, and the Lord intends for you to learn this, compassion towards others who suffer. The very last thing the church needs are more of Job's friends, friends. Men who speak profound theological truth. And it's a marvelous thing in some ways, right? A lot of, some of our our scripture proofs for the doctrine of God in our catechism and confession come from Job's friends. Completely misapplied, though, in an uncompassionate way. If you will be used of the Lord, expect that the Lord will make you experience affliction so that you can be as Jesus who is filled with what? Compassion and sympathy. Fourth, you must learn patience and grow in godly character. Patience, we talked about that this morning, and I thought it's so interesting that there's a bridge here between the two sermons. What we need to learn in affliction is patience. To be still and know God is God. To wait on God and not see myself as the mover and shaker of the universe. James 5.11 says, Ye have heard of the patience of Job. The patience of Job. You learn the sovereignty of God in affliction. You, You must learn that when you are frustrated in affliction... That is still indwelling residue that believes in some way you are God and that you deserve the very best. Instead of thinking of myself as a sinner who deserves hell and the least of his mercies is a blessing that is way too gracious for someone like me. Learn as well the godly man or woman's character in your affliction. Romans 5, 3 to 4. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Do you see? You see, the godly man, I'll speak at the end of this verse, but the godly man or woman glories in affliction and tribulation, knowing that there is something the Lord is working in me. And so the apostle says, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh, here it is again, patience and patience experience. And experience, which means to be as if battle-tested. Experience hope. The Lord works affliction in you to make you a tested, strengthened, patient Christian. And so, you must also learn to suffer in godly silence. Psalm 39.9, when you see these things, I was dumb, I opened not my mouth, because thou didst it. That's not, don't get, don't get David wrong, that's not a sullen, stoic, or despairing silence. It's a believing silence that has a quietness of spirit that trusts in God. Seeing God did this, affliction is good for me, and so I will not complain, I will not be bitter, I can still cry out to God. You see that these Psalms are all about crying out to God, but you're crying out to God and you're trusting in him, you're waiting on him and you say, I will be patient in affliction for you will remove it when the time is right because you promise you deliver me out of them all. So you don't fret. You don't grow anxious. You learn to be still once again knowing he is God. Fifth, And how hard a lesson this is to learn how to walk by faith and not by sight and sense. In your affliction, you must gain a greater sight of God. 
How did Moses endure? We talked about this a few weeks ago. Moses endureth as seeing him who is invisible. Verse 8 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. And what is that sight? Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. There's a sight of God that comes through faith. What you must see is that the Lord, your God, your covenant God, your loving Father of mercies, your Savior and Lord is the one who has afflicted you. Job 1, you think about how men who are afflicted, the godly see God. Job 1.21, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Where does his sight go immediately in that very first chapter as he is afflicted? The Lord, the Lord has done this. I see God, though I cannot see him with my eyes. That's how Moses endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, Joseph saw his brothers as what? Agents of God. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. Joseph saw God, not with his eyes, but by faith he saw this thing was done by God. All these men had a sight of God in their afflictions, not seeing him with their eyes, but by faith with the Spirit's union to Jesus Christ brought him into the mind's eye. Faith laying hold of the God of Scripture and seeing him who is invisible. So to see God, you need to learn to pray for more faith. Mark 9, 24, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. And that faith must take hold of the promises of God from the word of God. Unless, otherwise, the Bible says you will faint. And maybe some of you have been fainting in affliction. What did, what did David say? I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Here's that patience again. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen you, your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You see how he repeats himself. Wait on the Lord. Patience, patience, patience again. That is what faith does. It takes hold of the promises of God. It sees God as the first mover and the first cause of the afflictions. And it believes what the word says about affliction. And then it is patient. In our text, he has promised to deliver you from affliction. Will you believe it? I ask you that. Will you believe it? Will you believe he has bound himself to that word as an oath? Say to the Lord, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right, and thou in faithfulness thou hast afflicted me. Psalm 75. In faithfulness you have afflicted me. Is this how you treat affliction, child of God? That God is faithful to bring this affliction to me. That is what faith says. That is how faith sees God. You need to learn that no affliction to you is random or chaos. Every affliction has in love been particularly chosen for you by the great physician. This man needs this. This woman needs that. This child needs that. And that is how he chooses affliction. He knows where you need to be refined. He knows where I need to be refined. And he has selected the affliction for that aim. And this is the stuff that faith is made of in affliction. Faith believes, verse 22, the Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. Sixth, and we've heard this all along so I won't belabor the point too much. You must learn to pray. This is where we don't go. Or maybe we go there for, for the initial affliction and then in the midst of it we stop praying. But verse 15 says, and promises you this afflicted child of God, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The problem is for us, friends, is that the Lord has very little to listen to. Will you learn in affliction that his eye is fixed upon you, beloved? Verse 17, the righteous cry, the righteous cry, and the Lord delivers them out of all their troubles. James 5.13, is any among you afflicted? What? Let him pray. Prayer works faith in you, friends, and it draws on the power of Christ in your affliction. Do not think you will endure 
by yourself, but like the apostle, draw on the power of Christ and see the grace of God as sufficient, that his strength is perfected in weakness, that the power of Christ may uphold you. And if you feel like you're about to faint under under affliction, ask the Lord, cry to the Lord and wait upon the Lord. Pray, as the apostle says, without ceasing, and he will uphold you. Seventh, you need to learn your need for repentance. Look at verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto those who have a broken heart and a contrite, repentant spirit. In affliction, friends, it is time to learn, as David did, that affliction teaches us repentance. This is often the chastening of the Lord as a father chastens his child in Hebrews 12. Learn better to have an inward examination of your heart when you are afflicted. And what you need to understand from verse 18, right, where it says, The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. Understand from verse 18 that the Lord is what to you? Nigh to you when you are contrite and repentant. How we forget this. I think we would be more repentant, friends, if we knew that the Lord was close to us that he drew close to us. The repentance is a means the Lord uses to draw you to himself in affliction, to have the presence of God grow. So many, and this is a terrible shame, so many in the ministry, what they will not do is tell a sufferer to search their heart and see if there is a place that they need to repent. Not to berate them or add to their burden, No, instead, that they would point them. They should be pointing them to this truth. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart. To to be drawn towards repentance. And it is a temptation from the devil, in fact, to keep sufferers from examining their hearts. Why? Because the Lord, he knows the Lord is close to those who have a contrite, repentant spirit. And he would love to keep you from the Lord. Eighth. You must learn to glorify God. David, in the third verse, we read it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. You need to go, child of God, go and magnify the Lord in affliction. Go and worship the Lord. Praise him with psalms like Psalm 34, this psalm. In affliction and sorrow, I know it. You will be tempted tempted to retreat from the worship of God. No, you go to the Lord and you worship him. And yes, private worship is helpful, but never so much as corporate worship. It was when Asaph went into the sanctuary that his anguish melted. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until when? Until I went into the sanctuary of God, Psalm 73. That is why David says in this text, In the third verse, let us exalt his name together. In public worship, the godly learn to give glory to God for their affliction. And you know, some of you may come to a time when your affliction will actually be a separation from public worship. So until then, friends, take every advantage Take every advantage to be in public worship before you are singing the 42nd Psalm and verse 4. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept holy day. Learn to value public worship now before you start to grieve that you are afflicted and away from it. Many of us, we will, we will. This is just the sad truth of it. We will face this affliction in Psalm 42 as perhaps our very last affliction on earth before we enter glory. Remember, in that time, in that affliction, I just want to leave this for your comfort. When you are providentially kept from public worship, remember that the Lord has promised, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in Ezekiel 11 verse 16. But till then, friends, until you are struck that low, take up the word, take up prayer, take up the Psalms, and praise him if you are shut out of public worship for any reason, but especially take those things up in public worship. 
So, and again, this could be an entire sermon series. So many are the afflictions of the righteous, but he delivereth him out of them all. Remember these two promises, child of God, and glorify God in your sufferings. Suffer well, believing he delivereth you out of them all. Ask yourself constantly the question, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? And I want to say for most of us, we haven't suffered anywhere near that. Not anywhere near that. Nakedness, famine, sword. But what is the answer the scripture gives you to who shall separate us from the love of Christ? The answer Paul says is nay. No one shall separate us from the love of Christ. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thus saith the Lord, and we say amen and hallelujah. Please rise for prayer, if able. O Lord our God, We are a people who are in need of much patience, of much endurance. We are a people who need to learn the lesson of affliction, Father. And so we are so bold as to come before you that if affliction is necessary for our good, send affliction, O Lord, but only also open our hearts and our minds to understand your purpose in it and how we may conduct ourselves, that we would look to you, O God, in our affliction, that we would grow in holiness and that we would grow with a greater sense and sight of our God in Jesus Christ. Help us to look unto Jesus, especially in affliction. Help remind those of your people here who are being afflicted that no strange thing has come over them in affliction, but that many are the afflictions of the righteous. And help us all believe that you are faithful to deliver us from them all. Teach us what we must in the school of affliction, For the sake of your glory and for our good, we praise you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.